Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. Welcome back for another episode of the award-winning Compliance Into the Weeds, as always, joined by my colleague, Matt Kelly. Welcome back, Matt. Hello, Tom. How are you? Matt, uh, today I thought we might explore that age-old compliance question. Do you remediate during the pendency of your investigation? And I say age-old because it's been a question that I have heard bandied about at least since 2007. So what, why are you thinking about this and more importantly, blogging about it today? Because this idea was bandied about also at the Society of Corporate and Compliance and Ethics annual conference at the beginning of October, where I wandered into that session. It was quite good. It was led by a panel of executives. I can't remember all their names, so I will not play favorites and just say, if you're interested, look up the agenda to find out all of the speakers but they all brought some really good perspective about this very challenging issue uh, of, as they described it, how to fix the car while you are trying to figure out what is wrong with it at the same time. That is something I did a lot with my 78 Colt that I drove back in college. It was an excellent session at SCCE as well. So I took a lot of notes and I wrote up all of their big major themes. And uh, it is something that is well worth a compliance officer's thoughts. Matt, let's start with pursuing two paths at once. And uh, what struck Mm -hmm. me was it really identified two things that are going on when you're investigating a compliance violation. You want to pick it up from there? Yeah, that's uh, exactly what the session speakers had said, is that number one, you are trying to find out the actual facts, what happened. Um, And that might take some time to get a sense of exactly what happened. But the other path you are pursuing is really more about how this happened. And they're looking for process gaps. And the general line of thinking was that, yes, you should be able to remediate while you are investigating uh, and that you should because some of the process gaps that you find are going to be so self-evident that you'll know what you should do to seal up those gaps, irrespective of whatever other facts might later come to light. Um, And maybe if we give an example, we can help people understand this. So say you're investigating a bribery violation and you find that the bribes happened thanks to incomplete documentation when a reseller was requesting discounts on uh, your product being offered to end use customers. This is a time honored way to violate the FCPA is the reseller asks for a discount and you ask why, and they say competition, and then you give them the discount and then it becomes the funding for the bribe. That is a failure of documentation. Now, how often did the reseller do this? Uh, to what extent did they do it? You know, To exactly how many third parties were involved? All of that are, those are facts that you might still have to try and root out. But once you realize we had a documentation failure, well, that's a process gap and you know you're going to have to tighten it. So you could implement a compensating control right away that uh, you are now not going to offer any discounts without X, Y, and Z forms of documentation in hand and to be reviewed by a supervisor and co-signed by the CCO. That is a remediation It can be implemented, well, I was about to say easily, probably not easily, but you can implement it in fairly short order. um, And then all of that can happen while you are still trying to get to the bottom of things. So looking for facts could take a long time. Looking for process gaps, that could happen quite easily. And then once you see them, you can start to seal them up even while the investigation continues. Matt, you also wrote about uh, remediation and personnel actions. And it seemed to me the calculus, or at least uh, what you should consider in that decision, a little bit different than the process analysis you talked about previously. How did how did the panel see remediation and personnel decisions? Yeah, they urged a lot more caution as you are handling personnel matters, basically because you do not want to paint yourself into a corner where you have taken a personnel action early that the Justice Department subsequently at the end of the investigation says was not sufficient. So again, I'll give you an example from them. Uh, Let's say you have a manager who is problematic and you decide that the proper punishment there is giving him or her a warning or maybe a one-week suspension or something like that. 
and now the matter is closed. That was the remediation that you took for the errant employee. The investigation goes on, and then at the end of it, you tell the Justice Department that's what you've done, and the DOJ says, no, that's not enough. You need to fire that person. Um, Maybe they know something more about the person's misconduct. Maybe they know something more about other companies or parties involved in the issue. But at that point, you're not in a good position. You have to basically reopen this case that you thought was closed. You have to fire that employee. Um, That employee is certainly not going to be happy about this. Other coworkers might wonder what's going on. We thought this was closed. Is it not? Um, It's going to cause a lot of internal disruption. So your better bet would be to communicate early and often with the DOJ about, here's what we're thinking to do. Do you see any reason why this would be problematic? And see what they say. Um, As a side note, this might actually be a good way, way if you ask questions in the right way to try and pump the DOJ for whatever information they might have about this case that you don't know, but you think they know, well, you know, why would we be looking to fire them? Or do we have other bigger issues that we should also be looking at? Or is the misconduct in question more severe than we understand? Could you please help us, DOJ? Maybe they're not going to help you. Maybe they won't tell you anything. But um, it might be a good way to try and pull some of that information out. However, That's just all hypothetical. You know, the here and the now is that what you don't want is to be not on the same page with the Justice Department about employee discipline. So rather than implement that remediation step right away on your own, uh, you could just communicate with them early and often to let them know this is what you're thinking and see if you can stay on their their good side, in their good graces. Uh, This is also a good opportunity to remind everybody of the usefulness of putting employees on paid leave. They're still therefore required to cooperate with the company. You are still their employer. They have to participate in witness interviews or give depositions or whatever might happen. Uh, you can't get any of that if you fired them right away. And you know, the uh, speakers also did, however, call out As nifty as paid leave might be from the compliance officer's perspective, it's a useful tool. From the business manager's perspective, they are not going to like this because you've suspended one of their employees. They're down a person. They don't have necessarily the budget or permission to hire a temp to replace that person. So your interactions have interrupted their smooth functioning of their business department. Um, That might lead to ruffled feathers. So you might also need to engage in some diplomacy with uh, those operating units as you're putting their employees on paid leave to convince them that this really is the best course of action, even though you're asking them to bear the brunt of the uh, disruption. It was a good point to keep in mind. But those are some of the personnel issues that they talked about. Matt, do you how do you feel that squares with the consequence management section in the 2023 evaluation of corporate compliance programs? Does that does a company run afoul of not fulfilling the obligations under that section if they engage in the suspension with full pay? Or do you think that's where the conversation with the DOJ really helps? I think that's where a conversation with the DOJ would really help. The consequence management was more about you, company, please show us that you have a logic for doing what you did. <laughs> imposing this employee discipline and show us that you apply employee discipline consistently. Why are you suspending that manager for corruption in the Asia market, but doing nothing with the one who was corruption in the Africa market? Um, That seems inconsistent to us. Or why do the senior executives who should know better also get a one-day suspension? Why not a two-week suspension? Because they're the leaders who are supposedly setting the tone. You know, that's what the consequence management was about. It's looking for inconsistencies or lack of logic. Uh, It's also looking for lack of documentation. Uh, It also points out the need for very good record keeping here, which if you look at some of the early enforcement actions that talked about about, uh, consequence management, um, they go into some pretty painstaking detail about We want to see your records for this and this and this regarding how you make disciplinary decisions. But 
they don't really say, we expect you to do this disciplinary action in this specific circumstance. It's not that granular. Um, eventually, you'll have to have those conversations about, we are doing this action against this employee for this reason, but does it square with your policy? Is it consistent with prior actions? That's all, like, that's not unreasonable for the Justice Department to ask that. And, uh, you know, really, it still would never hurt to be able to communicate with the department. This is what we're thinking. Here's why it fits within our uh, consequence management policy. So do you have any, do you foresee any issues with what we're doing? And then see what the department says. Matt, did the panel have any thoughts on the following issue that I've seen multiple times? which is the law firm leading the investigative effort wants to control all information, ostensibly to protect the attorney-client privilege, but uh, to allow or facilitate remediation, you may have to disclose things that you uncover in an investigation, even if you don't turn them over to the government or want to claim the privilege around them. So that's sort of question number one. And then who should lead this effort? I understand it should be a cross-functional effort in remediation, but should it be the law firm who's heading the investigation? Should it be a separate, maybe not law firm, but a separate unit of some type? How do you reconcile, or how did the panel rather reconcile the inherent conflict that a law firm is going to have, and typically a corporation about wanting to control negative information as much as possible, where the compliance professional or whoever's heading the remediation effort may have a different view? They did talk about that that's a delicate matter, and it's well worth trying to think it through. Um, certainly, if you are running, say, a global investigation across borders, you're almost inevitably going to need legal counsel, outside legal counsel, especially to help manage the investigation that might be happening in a jurisdiction overseas. It might potentially even be legally required, um, depending on the jurisdiction. But that really is more about are we exercising attorney-client privilege as needed to keep the investigation details confidential when they should be and keep the investigation going on track in an objective way. That's not the same as something as crazy as, you know, like outside counsel recommending um, specific remediation actions. I mean, they, they can do that. You could take that at their word. But I, I think that it would still behoove the company to try and figure out its own remediation plan for those process gaps that you entail or that you uncover. Um, for example, this would be a great job for the internal audit function if you have one. Uh, these are the process gaps we've uncovered. Could you please investigate those yourselves? Could you please make recommendations on compensating controls we should implement? That's what internal audit is good at, and really it's what they're there for, to help. Um, and then see if their remediation actions square with any recommendations you might get from outside counsel. Um, I don't necessarily know that outside counsel always would give you specific remediation recommendations. Um, the point about outside counsel was really more about keeping attorney-client privilege as exercised as possible, if I can get away with framing it, phrasing it that way. And then, you know, when you have to sit down with the Justice Department and they're going to try and push you to disclose facts you don't want to necessarily disclose, that's when you and your legal team, inside and outside, you know, you're going to have to sit down and decide what you want to do. Um, but it's not, we should not conflate the investigation with the remediation. The remediation plans and whatnot, they can all be drawn up separate from or, you know, keeping one eye on what the investigation is uncovering. But a lot of times, you know, the remediation problems are going to be clear and you might as well go ahead with what are the controls we want to implement. Going back to the example I gave a while earlier about if it's lack of documentation, well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out we should have stronger documentation requirements and maybe some sort of management approval over that before we give out a discount willy-nilly. Um, you know, you don't necessarily need to keep that privilege to that discovery that you have a good remediation solution for the problem that you found. 
Matt, was there any uh, conversation or discussion, rather, around the following? This type of approach to remediation can lead to a CCO perhaps having greater comfort when they make their certification after the conclusion of the DPA, or that's not correct. At the time the DPA is signed, the CCO also has to sign off on that. Um, Any conversation around that? Not on that specific point with the panel when I was there, but I do think that you're on to something, that the sooner the company starts to engage in remediation, the more comfort the compliance officer will have that the remediation plans we're doing, they make sense, they work, they square with the severity of the facts that we have uncovered from the investigation. Uh, if you are communicating about this with the Justice Department over a longer time frame, I think that will only help you have a greater understanding of do they like my remediation plan? Do they not? Um, whereas if you really don't begin any remediation until you're actually, the investigation is complete, you're nearly ready to sign a resolution, and now we're going to start implementing the remediation plan. You don't necessarily know that that's going to work the way it's intended. Um, a lot of times you'll think the compensating control works. You'll find out later on it doesn't, and then you have to recompensate or introduce other controls. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I am not a lawyer, but nonetheless, I would just say common sense says the sooner that you can begin figuring out what is a good remediation strategy, and the more you can be communicating with that with regulators, the more that's going to help you, the more it will keep you in your comfort zone as you're going to start signing these CCO certifications. Matt, this was a, a really fascinating discussion simply because it's been going on for so long. And to have a panel discuss this and throw these ideas out and you can blog on it and we can podcast on it, I think is uh, great for the rest of the compliance folks out there. So can't wait to see what next week brings us. Thank you, Tom.